Okay, we're continuing talking about various thunderstorm hazards. We've talked about lightning, we've talked about thunder, we've talked about hail, we've talked about um, high winds, and now we're going to talk in particular about tornadoes. Okay? A tornado is a violently rotating, and it usually rotates in, the, in a counterclockwise manner in the northern hemisphere, so it's a violently rotating column of air that descends from a th thunderstorm and comes in contact with the ground, okay? If it doesn't come in contact with the ground, we usually just call it a funnel cloud, okay? Although tornadoes are usually brief, lasting only a few minutes, they can sometimes last for more than an hour and travel several miles, causing considerable damage. The United States experiences more tornadoes by far than any other country, okay? It's kind of like we're sitting in the perfect spot with the perfect conditions. In a typical year, about 1,300 tornadoes will strike the United States. The peak tornado season is April through June, and more tornadoes strike the central United States than any other place in the world, and this area has been nicknamed Tornado Alley, okay? So more tornadoes strike the central United States than any other place in the entire world, okay? All right. So you'll notice now, um, of course, Texas has the most, but Texas is a relatively large state. But Texas, um, usually on average about 139. This is Oklahoma, 57. Kansas, 55. Nebraska, 45. This is Missouri, um, Iowa, um, Illinois, I think. Anyway, and then it kind of diminishes out there. But this area in here. This area of the country is known as Tornado Alley. Okay. All right. Most of your tornadoes are spawned from supercell thunderstorms. Those are those really, really big, bad uh, thunderstorms that we sometimes get. Supercell thunderstorms are characterized by a persistent rotating updraft and form in environments of strong vertical wind shear. Remember, it mentioned wind shear um, a couple of screencasts ago. Wind shear is basically when you've got the wind at the ground level blowing one way and the direction that the wind is coming from changes as you go up in the atmosphere. So maybe it's blowing from the south at the ground, you go up a couple thousand feet and maybe it's blowing now from the east and a couple more thousand feet and it's blowing from the north or what have you, okay? That would be wind shear. The updraft lifts the rotating column of air created by the wind shear and produces a cyclonic rotation known as a mesocyclone, okay? I'm not um, particularly interested in you guys knowing that in particular, but um, just further information, okay? I do want you to remember, though, that most tornadoes are spawned from those supercell thunderstorms. When viewed from the top, the counterclockwise rotation of the mesocyclone gives the supercell its classic hook appearance when seen on the radar. And this is what a lot of meteorologists tend to look for and show when they are telling you about the possibility or the likelihood of a tornado. Okay, so you get a classic hook appearance. The image below is from the Doppler radar in Springfield, Missouri on May 22, 2011. This image was taken at 5.43 p.m. as an EF5 strength tornado was moving through Joplin, Missouri. Um, you guys were in elementary school at the time, but there was a major tornado that came through um, and leveled much of Joplin, Missouri. Okay. And if you will look very closely, so this is the radar image. And this is um, an image of what that mesocyclone looks like or gets set up as on the radar, where we have light rain, heavy rain, and then hail, and the whole thing is rotating, okay? If you look at the radar, you can see this hook, okay? You've got um, fuchsias in here, which is the really, really heavy rain, hail, and things like that, okay? So the colors indicate the intensity of rain, with green pre uh, representing the light rain, yellow and orange for moderate rain, reds and fuchsias for the heaviest rain and hail. 
So the classic hook pattern of the supercell from which a tornado was observed can be clearly seen. Okay? And you do see a hook if you look. I know you all have a black and white copy, but the, the fuchsia colors, there was red and fuchsia colors, show you that um, hook in that radar. All right. The exact processes for the formation of a funnel are not yet known. That's one of those things that, um, you know, that's a piece of meteorological phenomenon that it's, it's kind of hard to pin down exactly how it forms, exactly why it forms, where they're going to form, that kind of thing. There's a lot of information that we still need to learn. Okay. All right. The funnel cloud of a tornado consists of moist air. As the funnel descends, meaning moves down or drops from the cloud, the water vapor within it condenses into liquid droplets. The liquid droplets are identical to the cloud droplets, but they are not considered part of the cloud since they form within the funnel. The descending funnel is made visible because of the water droplets. So the reason why you see the funnel coming down is because you see basically a cloud. It's, it's not considered part of the cloud because it's part of the funnel. Um, but it's made of the same exact stuff as the rest of the cloud is. Okay? Due to air movement, dust and debris on the ground will begin rotating, often becoming several feet high and hundreds of yards wide. And you can see that on this picture here. You've already got a rotating area of dust and debris below this funnel cloud. After the funnel touches the ground and becomes a tornado, so it becomes officially a tornado when it touches the ground. And like I said, if, it, if it's just, you know, dipping below the cloud and rotating, we typically call it a funnel cloud, okay? The color of the funnel will change when it touches ground because the color is going to depend on the type of dirt and debris it's moving over. If it's moving over an area that has red dirt, then it's going to appear kind of as a red tornado. If black dirt is going to give it a black appearance, that kind of thing, okay? Tornadoes can last from several seconds to more than an hour, but most last less than 10 minutes. The size and or shape of a tornado is no measure of its strength. Okay, so that sort of further complicates how do we decide just how destructive they are. Occasionally, small tornadoes do major damage and some very large tornadoes over a quarter mile wide have produced only light damage. So it's kind of hard to nail down just how powerful they are based on their size. The tornado will gradually lose intensity. The condensation funnel decreases in size. The tornado becomes tilted with height. Um, and it takes on a sort of contorted, meaning twisted up, rope-like appearance before it completely dissipates and disappears. Okay. All right, then we're going to go to this next page and talk about the enhanced F scale, the enhanced Fujita scale. Okay, the Fujita scale is the scale that meteorologists use in order to try to get a handle on just how powerful a tornado was. Okay. All right. The Fujita scale was originally developed by uh, Dr. Tetsuya Fujita to estimate tornado wind speeds based on damage left behind by a tornado. But an enhanced Fujita scale developed by a forum of nationally renowned meteorologists and wind engineers, engineers uh, made improvements to the original F scale. Okay? So we, what we use now is the EF scale. Okay, although a lot of laymen, you know, um, normal people that are not in meteorology may still call it the F scale. Okay. The original F scale had limitations such as a lack of damage indicators, no account for construction quality and variability, and no definite correlation between damage and wind speed. These limitations may have led to some tornadoes being rated in an inconsistent manner, and in some cases an overestimate of tornado wind speeds. Okay. All right, so the improvement is that the EF scale takes into account, and I'm sorry, mine is kind of messed up. Hopefully, y'all's isn't. Um, the EF scale takes into account more variables than the original F scale did. Okay, so um, it's going to look at 28 different damage indicators, such as um, what type of buildings were present uh, and structures trees, land topography, all sorts of different things that are going to allow meteorologists to get a better handle 
on just how powerful that tornado was. Okay. Oops. Okay. So one more time. Okay, so one more time, let's take just one more look at the enhanced Fujita scale. Okay, an EF0 is going to be 60 to 65 to 85 miles an hour. An EF1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay. Um, but again, you, you don't have to be in an EF5 tornado to get signif significant damage due to a tornado. Okay. These are winds that are high enough. Those are hurricane force winds. I mean, they're, they're powerful enough to do all sorts of damage, okay? And honestly, it just gets worse and worse as you move down the scale, okay? All right. The last thing that we're going to talk about on this screencast is the last thunderstorm hazard that is mentioned, and it is flash flooding. And um, we've actually experienced some flash flooding. We had some people actually not able to make it to school um, this morning because we had some flooding in areas. Okay, here we go. Except for heat-related fatalities, more deaths occur from flooding than any other hazard. Why? Because most people fail to realize the power of water. Okay, for example, six inches of fast-moving flood water can knock you off your feet. Okay? Most flash floods are caused by slow moving thunderstorms. Um, thunderstorms that have repeatedly moved over the same area. So you get like this line of thunderstorms and each thunderstorm one after the other is moving over the same area over and over and over, um, producing heavy rains. And then you also get flash flooding typical of tropical uh, storms and hurricanes, again, because you have a lot of thunderstorms associated with those. Okay, These floods can develop within minutes or hours, depending on the intensity and duration of the rain, the topography, meaning the, you know, is the land flat, steep, you know, hilly, whatever, soil conditions and ground cover. Flash floods can roll boulders, tear out trees, destroy buildings and bridges, and scour out new channels. Rapidly rising water can reach heights of 30 feet or more. Furthermore, flash flooding, flash flood producing rains can also trigger, trigger catastrophic mudslides. Mudslides are not as much of a problem here because we are not in an area that is very, very um, hilly. We have sort of rolling hills. We don't have, you know, big, steep, steep, steep hills. But I would like to show you or point out something to you that you may not be aware of. Okay, so they say up here that most people do not realize the power of moving water. One gallon of water, okay, is over eight pounds. Okay, so when you go and look in the refrigerator at your gallon of milk, think about that much water, and that's eight pounds. And if you're talking about water that's six to eight to ten inches deep, moving you know, as, as a large body of water, you've got many, 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 many gallons all at eight pounds per gallon, and you've got this m gigantic moving force. Yes, it's water, and you think, oh, I can walk through water because it's fluid, but it's still, it's got a lot of weight, it's very heavy, and it can exert a lot of force, okay? So please, if you... Um, get to a point where you have water moving over a roadway, the whole motto is turn around, don't drown. Do not assume that you would be able to drive or walk through that um, moving water. Because a lot of people have uh, made that gamble and have failed and lost their lives. 